Lisa data. So what I did So is we're watching a live press conference from New Horizons Mission large, Control large Center large in Laurel in Maryland. And we heard it there, a good day, a historic leap as we get those incredibly historic pictures from New Horizons as it flew past in that historic flyby of Pluto. Well, I'm pleased to say that our guest is still with us. Brendan, this is an incredibly... Um, an, an important moment, but let's just get the enthusiasm that we heard at the beginning there. A good day. It's more than a good day, isn't it? Oh, it's nine and a half years in the making, even more for the planning of this mission. And they've just unleashed a treasure trove of information for us to dig into now, seeing images and they're getting readings back of the composition of Pluto. So it's one thing to get the fantastic detailed images, but to actually start to probe what the atmosphere of Pluto is like and Charon as well, which they've just announced is actually active. So there's some geological activity happening. These are not cold dead worlds in space. There is actually some, uh, you know, tugging and pulling between them. Yes, they got very excited to say that, um, that, that it is active. Just explain, so Sharon, what, what, what is that in terms of Pluto? So Sharon, actually, we, we think of it as, a, we've, we've called it technically a moon of Pluto, but actually we found by looking at it over time with the Hubble Space Telescope and New Horizons, that it's more of a binary dwarf planet. So the two of them orbit around and dance around each other. And it's quite substantially big. Charon is uh, about half the diameter of Pluto. Pluto itself uh, is only about 2,370 kilometers across. Uh, but there's a lot of a gravitational tug of war between these two bodies, which is probably keeping a lot of internal geological mechanisms going. So there's even hopes that perhaps underneath the ground on Pluto, underneath the icy surface, there might even be enough of a friction for there to be some liquid uh, underneath. So some of the methane ice uh, may be uh, liquefied deeper down. There's also carbon monoxide uh, and also nitrogen as well, all in ice form on the surface, perhaps liquid in, in underneath the surface. And we're expecting on Friday to hear about Pluto's atmosphere, so put that in, into context for us. It's a fantastic thing. We do, we do this wonderful technique in astronomy where we let the light pass through the atmosphere of a world uh, and the colours that are absorbed by the gases in the atmosphere, um, we end up with missing those colours when they are collected by the camera and the spacecraft, and we get a sort of chemical fingerprint. So it can actually tell us what gases are in those atmospheres. Um, so we've practiced this with things like the transit of Venus before, uh, but that's happily sitting here on Earth been able to do it. This is a spacecraft out there nine, uh, about five billion kilometers away, doing this all pre-programmed as well. Uh, and because of the time delay between the signals of four and a half hours for messages to be received, uh, this, the, the engineers and the scientists have have laid very well laid out plans. They've exercised this mission perfectly. It does certainly seem so. Now, we also heard um, speak of Hydra not being a planet. What does that mean? <laughs> so I think they were, it's a little tongue in cheek with that one because uh, the rules of a planet that we have, one of the key rules is that a planet should be roughly spherical. <laughs> and we so saw we have there this, it wasn't, yeah. Definitely this sort of more lumpy potato shape. Uh, so they're definitely saying this cannot be classified as a planet. Um, and Hydra is one of those ones, like they mentioned, they didn't have any real fix on its diameter. Somewhere uh, between, uh, I think, 40 kilometers and 100 kilometers across. Now we know it's about 28 miles across. So we actually have a good fix on that. Well, let's let's take a look now. This is these are live images. So there's there's Sharon. There's Sharon that we are talking about. It. But I'll look at listen to you. The reaction <laughs> Honestly, I'm getting from you, Brendan. I, I just that's... looked over and I thought maybe that's Pluto again. But no, it's that detailed. That's that is... Sharon. So what, it's it's um, Pluto's largest moon, which has been active. So we get, again, just what does that mean? Are we talking about life here? Uh, not in terms of life, but geological activity. So uh, sort of non-living, um, you know, processes taking place. So we can see there's a, a cracked surface as well. There may have been some stress and strain on this world. They're also, we're going to try and figure out as well what happens with that top part. You can see it's quite dark. So usually the darkening uh, of a surface means that uh, the radiation from the sun has darkened it over time. Um, but why the rest of it is so fresh, that's something we'll have to explore. But I'm, I'm just blown away because uh, my focus was on Pluto. And now, now it's, I think it's moved over to Sharon and stealing the show. It's, it's certainly, that's what we were hearing from, uh, from the mission control uh, pe people there who were obviously absolutely thrilled. Have we, so have we ever seen anything so detailed? Obviously not, but I mean, have you ever had any context of what, what is going on on Sharon? Um, not, not this geological activity. And the thing I'm really curious to hear is if, uh, even though Sharon is um, half the size, if it has a tenuous atmosphere of its own as well, maybe even 
uh, that there's some interaction between the atmosphere of Pluto and the atmosphere of Charon as well. Because Pluto and Charon are about 20 times closer than our moon is to our Earth. So they're very quite tightly knitted together um, around. And uh, what I love is if you look along where the nighttime side of Sharon is, you can see the craters and, and there are some shadows that? on there. Do so if you uh, look at the bottom, uh, bottom right in particular, right. you can definitely see this wonderful, uh, the sunlight is shining on the walls of the craters that are going up high and then dipping down, you've got the, the shadows that give you that uh, the curved crescent shadows and indicate the, the deep craters. The, 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 Brendan, the dark patch on the top, of course, we saw recently those images of that like heart-shaped patch on Pluto mm. itself. What's this, what, what do you think is this dark patch on top of Sharon? Well, potentially it's older material that's been bombarded by solar radiation for a longer time that can darken the material, so that's a possibility. One thing's for sure, this has uh, seen a lot of activity over time in terms of probably a lot of objects smashing into poor old Sharon and Pluto as well, uh, which has shaped its surface, shaped its uh, geology. Now, we are not seeing, that isn't Brendan Owen from the uh, Greenwich Royal Observatory. That is, of course, uh, live images from uh, the Mission Control Center for New Horizons. But, Brendan, just continuing this conversation, it's taking, how long does it take for these images to come down? Around four hours or so? Yeah, so the transmission is about four and a half hours, but actually there's a small data stream as well. The way I've been describing it is it's about 500 times slower than the old uh, dial-up internet that we used to have before broadband. So very, very small trickle feed of information that's coming back all together and this is actually what we're seeing now even though it's spectacular detailed this is a teaser because all the data that's left to be downloaded it will take about 16 months altogether to gather everything wow. gigabytes of data i wonder if we can get a, see an image of what we once had before new horizons came up i, I wonder Finale. so i'm not sure was this th these are these are the most the latest so this is the, the heart and even even i know that nasa were uh, doing a heart uh, a heart, I heart Pluto, uh, where well, you can cash in <laughs> where you can. It definitely works, yeah. But, um, so that's from Tuesday's approach towards mm -hmm. it. So what we get now are, um, we get a chance to, when it's on the nighttime side, to actually see the sunlight passing through. So um, we have all these wonderful bodies in the solar system that we've explored. And do you know what we'll see, actually? Probably a lot of pictures might, in the uh, coming days, will be in false colour, which will amplify different chemical elements on Pluto. So we're seeing different worlds here across this. Uh, Venus, when it's stripped away from the atmosphere, our wonderful planet Earth. Um, but seeing all these worlds, we use different eyes on New Horizons. So scanning it in ultraviolet light, in infrared, invisible light. So all those different forms of light will give us a better understanding of Pluto in its entirety. And ultimately, what will you do with that information, apart from getting incredibly excited, rightly so, but what, what, <laughs> what will you use this for? Well, what Pluto represents, and its moons as well, they represent this outer edge of the solar system, the Kuiper Belt, which is a, a very, very icy region of the solar system, somewhere where we're getting an insight into um, the uh, genesis of the solar system, how our planets came together. Investigating something like Pluto will give us a, a little look back into the history of the entire solar system. Um, these days we're actually looking beyond our solar system at planets around other stars and uh, we are trying to figure out where we've come from and um, especially analysing the types of ices that we find uh, on Pluto and its moons. It'll give us an idea perhaps even of where the seeds of life might come from. Wow, that's quite profound, actually, isn't it's it? Quite, it can go quite, quite deep. Yeah. And uh, of course, this has been so detailed in the planning. We, we've had so many advances in terms of all of this. We've had um, probes landing on comets. It's just phenomenal where we've come. It, it's a brilliant year. We're seeing the um, fr many space missions come to fruition now. And one thing I like to remember is that even though this technology was sent, um, you know, nearly a decade ago out there, so that technology is decade old. Uh, our processing techniques back here on Earth that can be put to use have advanced, so the software is advanced. So I think what we'll be able to pull out of this data will be beyond maybe even the wildest imagination of uh, the teams that first planned this back nine and a half years ago. Absolutely incredible. Brendan, thank you very much for being with us on that incredibly historic moment, those images of Pluto. My favorite comment, oh wow, when you first of all saw those images, absolutely priceless. <laughs> Brendan Owens, astronomer from the Greenwich Royal Observatory right here in London, thank you very much.